Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with another awesome war video. We're on to the Winter War. Uh, so I guess this takes around right before World War II uh, or, or, or the beginning of it kind of thing. Uh, don't know why it's called the Winter War. Uh, obviously, it takes place in the winter. Uh, I believe Finn, not, is Finland involved. I think I think I've seen a Finland flag when I pulled up uh, this picture up here, right here. Uh, so I think there. I'm not sure who else is involved. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't. You don't really hear much. I think about. I think it's Finland. <laughs> Watch me be wrong here about them when it comes to like, you know, the uh, World War II or anything. So this will be interesting uh, how they're involved. Uh, like I said, it's a more recent one. I haven't done one of these recent ones in a while. So I figured I'd jump in and do it. You know, it's been requested for a while. And yeah, let's just check it out, guys. Something different, you know. Got to switch it up a bit. Before we do, please hit that like and subscribe button below. Please and thank you. Oh, and I just did the, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it yet, I just did one of those Ancestry DNA tests. And I got the results back yesterday. So you guys should definitely go check out that video. Really cool stuff. I was definitely, uh, definitely... You know, pleasantly surprised with, you know, uh, you know, with my uh, background, I guess you could say. But you have to check it out, uh, you know, find out. But anyways, guys, we're going to jump right into this. Do, do, do. Like, subscribe, and we're going to do play. I really don't know what to expect in this, to be honest. Like, are we actually going to get video footage? Because, you know, it is a more recent one. Guys. Although World War II is often depicted as a conflict between two major alliances, it can be divided into many smaller wars, as the states not willing to join a side were often forced to fight on their own. A variety of factors led to a conflict between Finland and the Soviet Union in 1939 to 1940, the conflict we now know as the Winter War. In this video, we will describe Finland went against the Soviet Union? Seems odd. Okay. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to like, in my head, Finland, yeah, Finland's right there, kind of next to the Soviet Union. Okay, I was trying to think of like Finland, Sweden, Norway, right? Okay. <laughs> I must be wrong. Uh, taking my globe. Where are we at here? I can't. There you go. There you go. Norway, Sweden. Finland. Okay, so yeah, Finland is. I had to make sure, man. <laughs> I was good because I know those three are up there, but I'm sorry, I wasn't. I was 99% sure. I wasn't 100% sure. I wanted to make sure I had them in the right order. So, I apologize, you know, for that. I had to actually think about that for a second. But anyways, yeah, we're gonna chip into this. So I guess they're they share a border. So, I guess you know. Here we go the origins and opening moves of this conflict. If you're interested in the history of this era, don't forget to check out our second channel, The Cold War. The link is in the top right corner. Shout out to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. Star Trek Fleet Command is a free-to-play open-world strategic MMO game. Alliance, recruit new cadets, and fight the Klingon and Romulan. The relationship between Russia and Finland was always tumultuous due to a variety of geographical, political and economic factors. Finland was a constant field of battle between Sweden and Russian entities. The Treaty of Nürtaboy of 1323, signed by Sweden and the Novgorod Republic, divided Karelia, the region populated by the Balto-Finnic Karelians. As Sweden became more powerful over the next few centuries, it took over the rest of Finland and forced the Tsardom of Russia to cede more of South Karelia in 1617. However, fortunes would turn, and by the end of the Great Northern War and the Russo-Swedish War in the first half of the 18th century, Sweden had given Karelia to Russia. The two empires continued to fight, 
and Russia, supported by Napoleonic France, won the Finnish War in 1809. As a result, Russia annexed Finland, which became the autonomous Grand Duchy of Finland, with its own laws and administration, and the Russian Emperor as its Duke. Previously, a Swedish general, Gustav Moritz Armfeldt, had become an influential councillor for the Emperor Alexander I, and his influence was crucial in reuniting South Karelia with the duchy. The early period of liberal Russian rule in Finland gave way to a more autocratic approach over the second half of the 19th century, as Russian emperors made deliberate attempts to Russify the duchy. However, these methods only strengthened the national identity of the Finns, and the Fenomen movement underlined the yearning for independence. The autocratic policies of Nicholas II led to the assassination of his governor in Finland, which also joined the revolution of 1905 with a general strike. As a result, the autonomy of Finland was removed, and the Russification intensified. In November 1914, an underground student movement started plotting to gain independence, and was supported by Germany. To weaken Russia, the German Empire trained groups of Finns as Jaegers, elite light infantry. In February of 1917, Russia was rocked by a revolution. The Russian provincial government returned autonomous rights to the Finns. However, the internal situation in Finland wasn't great. Both left and right-wing parties vied for power, creating security forces known as the Red Guard and White Guard respectively. Okay. After the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government in November, all sides of the political spectrum in Finland were eager to declare independence from Russia, and they did just that on December 6th. The Bolsheviks were not strong enough to prevent this, and by the end of the year, Lenin's government recognized Finland's independence. The latter hoped that the Red Guard would make Finland communist and they would rejoin Russia down the line. With Germany and Sweden supporting the White Guard and the Bolsheviks supporting the Red Guard, Finland entered a period of civil war in January 1918. Both sides had around 100,000 troops, but the Whites had former officers of the Russian... I'm just, just going to say, like, I feel like I should know more about this because I have done have done Finland and have done Russia on the Geography Now videos. And I guess because it's more glossed over that it, they put, I guess, you know, put much time on it. It's probably where I, my, I'm kind of running a blank of, you know, this going on. I feel like I should know more about this. And so I apologize if you think I should because I might have been mentioned in those videos. But for some reason, like, this is like totally seems totally new to me. Uh, I like I knew there was some kind of issue between Finland and Russia. Like, you know, I I knew about like I didn't really know much about like I guess the details of it, but it, it, this all just seems new. So that's fine with me. I like learning this new stuff, man. Makes for a uh, makes for a, you know surprise when I watch these videos. You know, I I can't predict it. <laughs> Russian army and Jaegers fighting for troops but the Whites had former officers of the Russian army and Jaegers fighting for them, and they were led by a talented former general of the Russian army, Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. This, and the fact that the Germans occupied Red-controlled Helsinki in April 1918, allowed the Whites to win the civil war in May 1918. 40,000 Finns died in this war. To appease Germany, Finland elected Prince Frederick Charles of Hesse as a king, but even before he arrived, he abdicated due to the revolution in Germany, so the Finns opted for a presidential republic. Finnish nationalists wanted to take over Karelia, and three volunteer expeditions attempted to take the region in 1918 and 1919, all of which failed. Simultaneously, Finnish volunteers participated in the Estonian Liberation War helping the country to gain independence from the Soviets. At this point, Menahem created a plan to occupy the capital of Russia, Petrograd, modern St. Petersburg, but the government rejected the proposal. Finally, Finland and Soviet Russia signed the Treaty of Tartu in 1920, establishing new borders, with Finland gaining Petsamo and access to the Arctic Ocean, 
while ceding Repola and Poriyabi. In 1921, Karelia started a rebellion against the Bolsheviks and was supported by Finnish volunteers. This territory was crucial for the Soviets, as the Murmansk Petrograd Railway was in the region and they moved overwhelming forces to Karelia to secure it. Despite some early success, this uprising was crushed in early 1922. In the same year, the Russian Civil War was concluded, and the victorious union of Soviet Socialist Republics became too strong for Finland to continue these expeditions. Over the next decade, Finland put its faith in the League of Nations, and then its declared neutrality. Simultaneously, Finland enacted a mandatory military training program, and by 1939, more than 180,000 soldiers and officers took part in it. Finland also started building a defensive line from the Gulf of Finland to Lake Ladoga, predicting that the region of the Karelian Isthmus would be the central area of attack of the Soviet forces in a possible war. This chain of fortifications, called the Manaheim Line after the leader of the Finnish troops, was 150 kilometers long and was built between 1920 to 1924 and 1932 to 1939. It integrated various smaller lakes and swamps along its frontier. Stalin, who became the Soviet leader at the end of the 20s, considered Finland to be a threat. He wasn't sure that the Finns wouldn't support Germany and allow its troops to attack the USSR through Finland. At the same time, the proximity of the Finnish borders to St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad, and to the Murmansk-Leningrad Railway was making the Treaty of Tartu tenuous at best. Hmm. According to the sources, the Soviet Red Army started building railway tracks towards the Finnish border sometime in 1935, planning to use them in a possible invasion. In 1938 and 1939, Soviet diplomats approached the Finns, asking for a new treaty with guarantees that in case of a German invasion, Finland would fight against it and even allow the Soviets to enter the country and join its defense. Stalin was still reorganizing his army after the Great Purge of 1936 to 1938, so he started to look for allies but was firmly rejected by France and the United Kingdom. As a result, Stalin turned to Hitler and signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany. Officially, this was a non-aggression pact, but its secret clauses divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with the USSR getting Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Eastern Poland. Worried, the Finns attempted to create a Scandinavian alliance, hopeful that a sizable Swedish army would serve as a deterrent. However, this hope was crushed when Sweden caved in to the German and Soviet demands. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and started World War II. In response, the British and French declared war on Hitler. In mid-September, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Soon Poland was occupied entirely, despite staunch resistance, its territory divided between the Nazis and the US. Just a poor Poland, man. I think I just did a Poland geography video. It's like, uh, I mean, they they always seem to get the worst of it, but they bounce back. They always they're tough guys, man. They bounce back. Anyways, I know this is not about Poland, but it just makes me it makes me laugh because, man, you know. Despite staunch resistance, its territory divided between the Nazis and the USSR. Stalin immediately demanded that the Baltic countries grant his forces military access, and the latter agreed, allowing almost 80,000 Soviet troops to set up bases. In response, Finland intensified the building of the Mannerheim Line, adding 150 concrete bunkers in short order. On the 5th of October 1939, Stalin summoned a Finnish delegation to Moscow. The Soviets demanded the border along the Karelian Isthmus be moved to the northwest, away from Leningrad. They also demanded the islands in the Gulf of Finland and the Kalasta Yansarento Peninsula, the establishment of a Soviet military base on the Hanko Peninsula, what? and the destruction of all fortifications on the Karelian Isthmus. In return, Finland would have received Repola and Poyayabi. Simultaneously, 
Both sides started mobilizing their forces under the guise of training, and the Finns began evacuating civilians from the Karelian Isthmus. I was going to say, like, the Finland just put all that work in to kind of make, like, a wall kind of down here, right? So they're not just going to, like, back out on that now and, like, just hand, it, hand that over. And uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, the offer from, uh, you know, the Soviets, you know, I just think it was doomed from the get-go. But, man, I, I can just feel the tension, like, kind of building here. ...of training, and the Finns began evacuating civilians from the Karelian Isthmus and the cities along the Baltic coast. Even though Hermann Goering approached the Finnish government and asked them to agree to these demands, the Finns attempted to negotiate, giving their counteroffer and receiving another Soviet demand, which they responded to with another counteroffer. On the 13th of November, the negotiations broke down. On the 26th of November, a Soviet border post was attacked in an incident later known as the shelling of Manila. The Soviets immediately claimed that it was a Finnish attack and demanded they move their forces away from the border. Finland denied this and called for an independent commission to investigate the event. Modern sources have confirmed that it was a false flag operation conducted by the USSR to implicate the Finns. On the 29th of November, the Soviets broke diplomatic relations with Finland, and one day later... Wow! <sighs> the Soviets were trying to, like, lie and say Finland, you know, try to attack and use that as, you know, an excuse kind of to go to war and kind of, I guess, kind of gain, you know, support, you know, from, the, from Europe, I guess. And... You know, Finland wasn't buying it, and man, I, I just, man, can you just feel the tension? Like, I don't even really know nothing at all about this war, and I can feel it, man. I'm just waiting for things, i just waiting for things to explode right now, man. <laughs> I gotta remind myself, too, that this is World War II. There's planes, you know, there's tanks, you know, all that stuff, you know. Every time I jump these big time periods, I remind myself that there's you know, different tactics involved here. We're not dealing with like people on horses, you know, with swords and stuff like that, you know, and bow and arrows. And so, yeah, let's do it. But the Soviets broke diplomatic relations with Finland and one day later renounced the non-aggression pact between their two countries. The Winter War had begun. The leader of the Soviet army in the region was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, commander of the Leningrad military district, Meretskov, who had four well-equipped armies at his disposal. The 7th Army under Yakovlev had nine infantry divisions, plus one tank and four armoured brigades. It was tasked with taking over the Karelian Isthmus and the city of Vipuri, and then pushing to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. Although the Soviets knew about the Mannerheim Line, they lacked details and the 7th Army was expected to achieve its goals in three weeks, which was extremely optimistic, even considering that the Ladogan and Baltic fleets were going to assist. The 8th Army under Kabarov consisted of five infantry divisions and one light-armoured brigade, and it was entrusted with a breakthrough to the north of Lake Ladoga. The army would then either drive deep or attack the Finnish defenders of the Karelian Isthmus from the rear. Commanded by Dehanov, the 9th Army had four divisions and an objective to take Kiyani and then Olu, thus cutting Finland in two. In the far north, Frolov's 14th Army consisted of two infantry divisions and one mountain division. Frolov, supported by the Soviet northern... I'm here. I'm just curious now because like I don't know like how this plays out or anything, but I do know that Germany later on ends up pushing in, uh, you know, to the Soviet Union, you know. So I know they end up, you know, Germany ends up pushing in. So I wonder if that ends up coming into play, I guess, later on in this video or series or whatnot, and kind of it is a big reason why maybe. Russia might back out of this war, you know, or they might be winning and then end up, you know, having, you know, let go of all their, you know, their winnings because of that. Or maybe that has no effect and they actually gain and keep ground in Finland. 
I don't know. Maybe they don't even have any kind of success in feeling. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious to me if that plays a part in it later on. Divisions and one mountain division. Frolov, supported by the Soviet Northern Fleet, was ordered to seize Petsamo, as that would have prevented a possible intervention via Norway or the Barents Sea, and then swing south towards Rovaniemi. In total, the Soviet army had 425,000 soldiers, 3,000 artillery pieces, 2,300 tanks, and 2,500 planes. In comparison to the 24 Soviet divisions, Finland had just 14, and even those were 20% smaller in terms of military personnel, for a total of two. I, uh, you know, I, I know I already kind of already, kind of already knew that Soviet soviets would have like you know bigger numbers but they're the aggressors here you know finland is going to be on the defense and obviously you know it's a lot it's better you know to be on i think it's easier to be on defensive than it is to be on the offense you know because you can hunker down and they're the ones who had to come to you uh so you know i think that just makes things kind of even you know the fact that you know finland's not trying to gain land here they're just trying to hold their own and keep them out and so they have, the, they have the home field advantage and the people in Finland, you know, they're going to win everyone. It's like every man has to step up. Every man and woman has to step up and uh, basically fight for their country because if they don't, you know, the Soviets can just take over, you know, so that they have that. They do have that advantage of that. They have to. 200 and 65,000 soldiers. The army of the Isthmus was commanded by Ersterman and consisted of six divisions, with the 3rd Army Corps on his left flank and the 2nd Army Corps on the right. The 4th Army Corps under Heiskanen was located to the north of Laduga and had two divisions, while the North Finland group, led by Tuompo, was made up of the border guards, reservists and former members of the White Guard. The Finns also had just 500 artillery pieces, 26 tanks, and 270 planes, which meant that the Soviets had an overwhelming advantage in aerial combat and in open terrain. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Finns had a shortage of artillery ammunition and even small arms, which meant that they had no hope to win open battles. However, most of the territory that would be initially attacked by the Soviets was impassable for tanks so they needed a breakthrough to get into the area more suitable for their armour. The Finnish forces were mostly concentrated on the Karelian Isthmus and to the north of Ladoga, with smaller groups in north and central Finland. Those less populated areas were convenient for large-scale guerrilla combat, but on the Isthmus and around Ladoga, the Finns would be forced to fight the Soviets head-on. Despite being heavily propagandized, the Mannerheim line was hardly impassable, as the Finns didn't have enough artillery and bunkers, with its weakest point being near Summa. The line's strongest points were on the Gulf of Finland and Lake Ladoga, as the defenders managed to create effective artillery systems on the nearby islands. Mannerheim expected his army to contain the Soviets for up to six months, after which, he hoped, Finland would be supported by France and the UK. The war started on the morning of the 30th of November with Soviet artillery volleys against the Finnish lines and bombing runs against the nearby cities, leading to civilian casualties. So cool. On the Isthmus, the Finnish border was mostly defended by the reservists and border guard belonging to the 11th Division. Although heavily outnumbered, I was going to say, like, right now, man, Russia just got on Russia. Uh, the Soviets are just going to, like, plow through them, man. They just look, like, a lot stronger right now. So, man, I don't know how you're going to hold on, man. You know, Soviets seem like they're come, they're not playing right here. Uh, wow. I, I like the pieces. I like the, the, the graphic. You know, how it's cool. That border guard belonging to the 11th Division. Although heavily outnumbered, this group was able to hold the Soviet advance for seven days before wow. they retreated behind the Mannerheim line. This stalwart defense gave enough time for other Finnish divisions to take their positions along the line. As the Finns had a more significant concentration of forces on the right flank, 
the Soviets decided to delay their plans to attack towards Vipuri and continue the advance on their right. Crossing the Voxi River seemed like a great way to split the enemy front, but the Taipale River was a more comfortable crossing, so the Soviet 150th and 49th Divisions were tasked with attacking there. However, this lag allowed the Finnish 10th Division defending there to concentrate more artillery in the area and start shelling the Soviets, leading to severe casualties. The Soviet artillery counter-volleyed and their troops began the crossing. Although the Finnish batteries managed to inflict even more damage on the Soviets coming across, and there were counter-attacks, by the 12th the Red Army had gained a foothold on the Kokoniemi Peninsula. Here they started waiting for the 49th Armoured Brigade to arrive. At the same time hoping to gain multiple footholds, the Soviets launched an attack on the town of Kivinyemi. As the commander of the 7th Army, Yakovlev, was pressured to make progress as quickly as possible, they attacked as soon as engineer battalions arrived, with no reconnaissance or artillery support. Hundreds of Red Army soldiers died in this failed attack on the night of the 7th of December. Wow. Despite that, Yakovlev informed his... Like, no reconnaissance, basically just going in blind, I guess, you know, just trying to overpower them. And yeah, I guess he just rushed in there, maybe trying to get, I guess, trying to get him, you know, you know, not ready, you know, but Finley, man, they're holding him back there, man. But, you know, you know, the Soviets are gaining some ground, you know, so interesting. His superiors that he had a foothold and ordered his troops to attack again. His soldiers refused to carry out the order in an unprecedented fashion. On the 8th, Yakovlev was relieved of his duties and replaced by Meritskov himself. Soviet headquarters ordered more troops to join the 7th Army. Meritskov decided that he needed to attack simultaneously along Lake Ladoga and towards Vipuri to put more pressure on the defenders, but that caused even more chaos as the Soviets started moving artillery and armor towards the Gulf of Finland and the two small roads in the area weren't nearly enough. This delay was used by the Finns to reinforce and camouflage their positions. So, when the Soviet right flank troops started barraging the enemy, they barely did any damage. On the other hand, Finnish artillery was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Red Army soldiers attacking around the Kokoniemi Peninsula. After each volley, the Finns would move their cannons to a new position, making it impossible for the Soviets to pinpoint their batteries. The Soviets' attempts to make their foothold larger continued until the 25th, but were stopped, losing thousands of troops and almost all of their tanks. Damn. However, to the west, Stalin's units managed to gain another foothold by taking Krelia. The Finns were able to bring more troops to the area and started shelling the Soviet foothold. This prevented the Soviets from gaining even more territory to the north of the river, and by the 28th, the remaining Soviet troops were forced to retreat. Wow. Thus ended the Battle of Taipale. The Soviets lost more than 10,000 soldiers, while the Finnish casualties were around 2,000. However, this was just the beginning of the Winter War, and we're planning to talk more about it down the line. Our second channel, The Cold War, deals Wow, there you guys have it. Uh, the Winter War. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, uh, you know, Finland kind of held them off there, you know, and they had, you know, the Soviets had, you know, more deaths, you know, they lost more men. So I guess, you know, Finland kind of takes round one here. I mean, uh, the Soviets do have, they are in, you know, the, there are, are in Finland, have pushed some some distance in there so that, that that's a plus on them but they did lose a lot of men but wow and i'm surprised that especially in the soviet army that troops said no we're not crossing we're not fighting because like that's huge like i'm surprised like you know they didn't say like a you know like uh, i just heard i heard you know i've seen movies and stuff where you know if which was like one of the movies i've seen I know this is probably all just you know, your propaganda or all fake, but I think it was Enemy at the Gates, uh, where the the Soviets were sending in troops. I think it was Stalingrad, and 
any people who were treated, they, they were shot, you know? So I'm surprised that maybe that was, maybe this that was, that wasn't mentioned here. Maybe that wasn't a thing here, uh, or at this time, but like that, that kind of bugger was like, that was just, you know, brought to mind when they said they weren't going to fight, you know, that's a movie and I was probably wrong. You guys can definitely like correct me in the comments or let me know what the deal is with that, you know? So, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that that was just brought to mind. But I guess they just replaced uh, the commander, and I, you know, so I guess nothing like that did happen. So you know, which which I'm glad, you know. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess they were like, we already tried fighting this time, we couldn't win, so we're not going again. So uh, yeah, that was definitely interesting with that with that moment. But wow, like I didn't really, I don't know nothing about this war, so this is definitely interesting. I'm kind of curious to see how far Russia goes here, and uh obviously it's just the beginning of the series i'm curious to see how you know, the soviets i'm sorry if i keep saying russia the soviets uh their allies come into play like i'm kind of surprised we didn't see you no know, ships come across here maybe they kind of get a foothold in farther along the coastline here but i guess we'll find out in future videos guys let me know what you guys think of this uh video and if you've seen it before are you guys excited with excited for me you know it's a lot of cool stuff to come and yeah thank you guys for watching please hit that like and subscribe button i hope you guys continue the journey with me uh through this war and yeah exciting stuff to come i'm sure but anyways guys peace catch you guys in future videos this is awesome i'm out